Stillness is the key. Preface. It was the late first century AD. Lucius Aeneas Seneca, Rome's most influential power broker, its greatest living playwright, and its wisest philosopher was struggling to work. The problem was the earth shattering, soul rattling noise that poured in from the street below. Rome had always been a loud city. Think New York City construction loud, but the block where Seneca was staying was a deafening cacophony of disturbances. Athletes worked out in the gymnasium beneath his suite of rooms, dropping heavy weights. A masseuse pummeled the backs of two fat men. Swimmers splashed in water. At the entrance of the building, a pickpocket was being arrested and making a scene. Passing carriages rumbled through the stone streets, while carpenters hammered away in their shops and vendors shouted their wares. Children laughed and played. Dogs barked. And more than the noise outside his window, there was a simple fact that Seneca's life was falling apart. It was crisis upon crisis upon crisis. Overseas unrest threatened his finances. He was getting older and could feel it. He had been pushed out of politics by his enemies and now on the out with Nero, he could easily, at his emperor's whim, lose his head. It was not, we imagine, from the perspective of our own busy lives, a great environment for a human to get anything done. Unconducive to thinking, creating, writing, or making good decisions, the noise and distractions of the empire were enough, quote-unquote, to make me hate my very powers of hearing, Seneca told a friend. Yet for good reason, this scene has tantalized admirers for centuries. How does a man besieged by adversity and difficulty not only not go out of his mind, but actually find the serenity to think clearly and to write incisive, perfectly crafted essays, some in that very room which would reach millions upon millions and touch on truths that few have ever accessed. Quote unquote, I've toughened my nerves against all that sort of thing. Seneca explained to that same friend about the noise. I forced my mind to concentrate, to keep it from straying to things outside itself. All outdoors, maybe Bedlam provided there is no disturbance within. Ah, isn't that what we all crave? What discipline, what focus. To be able to tune out our surroundings, to access one's full cap capabilities at any time, in any place, despite every difficulty. How wonderful would that be? what we'd be able to accomplish, how much happier we would be. To Seneca and to his fellow adherents of Stoic philosophy, if a person could develop peace within themselves, if they could achieve apathia, as they called it, then the world could be at war. They could still think well, work well, and be well. You may be sure that you are at peace with yourself, Seneca wrote, when no noise reaches you, when no word shakes you out of yourself, whether it be flattery or a threat, 
or merely an empty sound buzzing about you with unmeaning sin. In this state, nothing could touch them, not even not even a deranged emperor. No emotion could disturb them. No threat could interrupt them. And every beat of the present moment would be theirs for a living. That's a powerful idea, made all the more transcendent by the remarkable fact that nearly every other philosophy of the ancient world, no matter how different or distant, came to the exact same conclusion. It wouldn't matter whether you were a pupil at the feet of Confucius in 500 BC, a student of the great Greek philosopher Democritus 100 years later, or sitting in Epicurus garden a generation after that, you would have heard equally emphatic calls for this imperturbability and ruffledness and tranquility. The Buddhist word for it was upeka. The Muslim spoke of aslama. The Hebrews Hishtavit, the second book of the Bhagavad Gita, the epic poem of the warrior Arjuna, speaks of samatvam, an evenness of mind, a peace that is ever the same. The Greeks, Euthymia and Hesychia, the Epicureans, Tarashia, the Christians. Equanimitas, in English, stillness. To be steady while the world spins around you. To act without frenzy. To hear only what needs to be heard. To possess quietude, exterior and interior, on command. To tap into the Tao and the Legos, the word, the way. Buddhism. Stoicism, Epicureanism, Christianity, Hinduism. It's all but impossible to find a philosoph philosoph <laughs> philosophical school or religion that does not venerate this inner peace, this stillness, as the highest good and as a key to elite performance and a happy life and when basically all the wisdom of the ancient world agrees on something only a fool would decline to listen introduction the call to stillness comes quietly the modern world does not in addition to the clatter and chatter and intrigue and infighting that would be familiar to the citizens of Seneca's time. We have car horns, stereos, cell phone alarms, social media notifications, chainsaws, airplanes. Our, our personal and professional problems are equally overwhelming Competitors muscle into our industry, our desks pile high with papers and our inboxes overflow with messages. We are always reachable, which means that arguments and updates are never far away. The news bombards us with one crisis after another on every screen we own, of which there are many. The grind of work wears us down and seems to never stop. We are overfed and undernourished, overstimulated, overscheduled, and lonely. Who has the power to stop? Who has time to think? Is there anyone not affected 
by the din and dysfunctions of our time. While the magnitude and urgency of our struggle is modern, it is rooted in a timeless problem. Indeed, history shows that the ability to cultivate quiet and quell the turmoil inside us, to slow the mind down, to understand our emotions, and to conquer our bodies has always been extremely difficult. All of, our, all of humanity's problems, Blaise Pascal said in 1654, stems from man's inability to sit quietly in a room alone. In evolution, distinct species like birds and bats have often evolved similar adaptations in order to survive. The same goes for the philosophical schools separated by vast oceans and distances. They developed unique paths to the same critical destination, the stillness required to become master of one's own life, to survive and thrive in any and every environment, no matter how loud or busy. Which is why this idea of stillness is not some soft New Age nonsense or the domain of monks and sages, but in fact, desperately necessary to all of us. Whether we're running a hedge fund or playing in a Super Bowl, pioneering research in a new field or raising a family, it is an attainable path to enlightenment and excellence, greatness and happiness, performance as well as presence for every kind of person. Stillness is what aims the archer's arrow. It inspires new ideas. It sharpens perspective and illuminates connections. It slows the ball down so that we might hit it. It generates a vision, helps us resist the passions of the mob, makes space for gratitude and wonder. Stillness allows us to persevere, to succeed. It is the key that unlocks the insights of genius and allows us regular folks to understand them. The promise of this book is the location of that key and a call not only for possessing stillness, but for radiating it outward like a star, like the sun for a world that needs light more than ever. The key to everything. In the early days of the American Civil War, there were a hundred competing plans for how to secure victory and whom to appoint to do it. From every general and for every battle, there was an endless supply of criticism and dangerous passions. There was paranoia and fear, ego and arrogance, and very little in the way of hope. There is a wonderful scene from those fraught first moments when Abraham Lincoln addressed a group of generals and politicians in his office at the White House. Most people at that time believed the war could only be won through enormous, decisively bloody battles in the country, as big as cities like Richmond and New Orleans, and even potentially Washington, D.C. Lincoln, a man who taught himself military strategy by poring over books he checked out 
from the Library of Congress, laid out a map across a big table and pointed instead to Vicksburg, Mississippi, a little city deep in Southern Territory. It was a fortified town high on the bluffs of the Mississippi River, held by the toughest rebel groups. Not only did it control navigation of that important waterway, but it was a juncture for a number of other important tributaries, as well as rail lines that supplied Confederate armies and enormous slave plantations across the South. Vicksburg is the key, he told the crowd with the certainty of a man who had studied the matter so intensely that he could express in it the simplest of terms. The war can never be brought to a close until that key is in our pocket. As it happened, Lincoln turned out to be exactly right. It would take years. It would take incredible equanimity and patience, as well as ferocious commitment to his cause. But that strategy, laid out in that room, was what won the war and ended slavery in America forever. Every other important victory in the Civil War, from Gettysburg to Sherman's march to the sea to Lee's surrender, was made possible because, at Lincoln's instruction, Ulysses S. Grant laid siege to Vicksburg in 1863 and, by taking the city, split the South into two and gained control of that important waterway. In his reflective, intuitive manner, without being rushed or distracted, Lincoln had seen and held fast to what his own advisors and even his enemy had missed because he possessed the key that unlocked victory from the rancor and folly of those early competing plans. In our own lives, we face a seemingly equal number of problems and are pulled in countless directions by competing priorities and beliefs. In the way of everything, we hope to accomplish personally and professionally said obstacles and enemies. Martin Luther Jr. observed that there was a violent civil war raging within each and every person between our good and bad impulses, between our ambitions and our principles, between what we can be and how hard it is to actually get there. In those battles, in that war, stillness is the river and the railroad junction through which so much depends. It is the key. To think clearly, to seeing the whole chessboard, to making tough decisions, to to managing our emotions, to identifying the right goals, to handling high pressure situations, to maintaining relationships, to building good habits, to being productive, to physical excellence, to being fulfilled, to capturing moments of laughter and joy. Stillness is the key to, well, just about everything, to being a better parent, a better artist, a better investor, a better athlete, a better scientist, a better human being, to unlocking all that we are capable of in this life. This stillness can be yours. Anyone who has concentrated so deeply that a flash of insight or inspiration suddenly visited them knows stillness. Anyone who has given their best to something felt pride of completion, of knowing they left absolutely nothing in reserve, that's stillness. Anyone who has stepped forward with the eyes of the crowd upon them and then poured all their training into a single moment 
of performance, that stillness, even if it involves active movement. Anyone who has spent time with that special, wise person and witnessed them solved in two seconds the problem that had vexed us for months. Stillness. Anyone who has walked out alone on a quiet street at night as the snow fell and watched as the light fell slowly on that snow and is warmed by the contentment of being alive, that too is stillness. Staring at the blank page in front of us and watching as the words pour out perfect prose at a loss for where they came from. Standing on fine white sand, looking out at the ocean. Really, any part of nature. And feeling like being part of something bigger than oneself. A quiet evening with a loved one. The satisfaction of having done a good turn for another person. Sitting alone with our thoughts and seizing for the first time the ability to think about them as we were thinking them, so stillness. Sure, there is a certain ineffableness to what we are talking about, to calculating the stillness that the poet Rena Maria Rilke described as full, complete, where all the random and approximate were muted. Although we speak of attaining the Tao, Lao Tzu once said, there is really nothing to obtain or to borrow. A master's reply to a student who asked where he might find Zen, you are seeking for an ox while you are yourself on it. You've tasted stillness before. You've felt it in your soul. And you've wanted more of it. You need more of it. Which is why the aim of this book is simply to show how to uncover and draw upon the stillness we already possess. It's about the cultivation and the connection to that powerful force given to us at birth, the one that has atrophied in our modern busy lives. This book is an attempt to answer the pressing question of our time. If the quiet moments are the best moments, and if so many wise, virtuous people have sung their praises, why are they so rare? Well, the answer is that while we may naturally possess stillness, accessing it is not easy. One must really listen to hear it speaking to us and Answering the call requires stamina and mastery. To hold the mind still is an enormous discipline. The late comedian Gary Scheindling reminded himself in his journal as he struggled to manage fame and fortune and health problems. One which must be faced with the greatest commitment of your life. The pages that follow tell stories and strategies of men and women who are just like you, who struggle as you struggle amid the noise and responsibilities of life, who manage to succeed in finding and harnessing stillness. You'll hear sounds of the triumphs and trials of John F. Kennedy and Fred Rogers and Frank and Queen Victoria. There'll be stories about Jesus and Tiger Woods, Socrates, Napoleon, the composer John Cage, Sudaru, O, Roseanne Cash, Dorothy Day, Buddha, Leonardo da Vinci, and Marcus Aurelius. We'll also draw on poetry and novels, philosophical texts, and scientific research. We'll read every school and every era we can find to find strategies to help us direct our thoughts, process emotions, and master our bodies. So we can do less and do more, accomplish more but need it less, feel better and be better at the same time. To achieve stillness, we'll need to focus on three domains, the timeless trinity of mind, body, and soul, the head, the heart, and the flesh. 
in each domain will seek to reduce the disturbances and perturbations that make stillness impossible to cease to be at war with the world and within ourselves and to establish a lasting inner and outer peace instead you know that is what you want and what you deserve that is why you picked up this book so let us answer the call together let us find let us log into the stillness that we seek part 1 mind the mind is restless krishna impetuous self-willed and hard to train to master the mind seems as difficult as to master the mighty winds the bhagavad gita the domain of the mind the entire world changed in the few short hours between when john f kennedy went to bed on october 15 1962 and when he woke up the following morning because while the president slept the cia identified the ongoing construction of medium and long range soviet ballistic nuclear missile sites on the island of cuba just 90 miles from the american shores as kennedy would tell a stunned american public days later each of those missiles is capable of striking washington dc the panama canal cape canaveral mexico city or any other city in the southern eastern part of the united states in central america or in the caribbean as kennedy received his first briefing on what we know now know as the cuban missile crisis or simply as a 13 days the president could consider only the appalling stakes as many as 70 million people were expected to die in the first strikes between the united states and russia but that was just a guess no one actually knew how terrible nuclear war would be what kennedy knew for certain was that he faced an unprecedented escalation of the long brewing cold war between the united states and the ussr and whatever factors had contributed to its creation no matter how inevitable war must have appeared yet it fell on him at the very least to just not make things worse because it might mean the end of life on planet earth kennedy was a young president born into immense privilege raised by an aggressive father who hated to lose in a family whose motto they joked was don't get mad get even with almost no executive leadership experience under his belt it's not a surprise then that the first year and a half of kennedy's administration had not gone well in april 1961 kennedy had tried and failed embarrassed embarrassingly so to invade cuba and overthrow fidel castro at the bay of pigs just a few months later he was diplomatically dominated by soviet premier nikita khrushchev in a series of meetings in vienna kennedy would call it the roughest thing in my life sensing his adversary's political weakness and likely aware of the chronic physical frailty he endured from addison's disease and back injury suffered during the world war 2 khrushchev repeatedly lied to kennedy about any weapons being placed in cuba insisting that they would be for the defensive purposes only which is to say that during the missile crisis kennedy faced as every leader will at some point in their tenure a difficult test amid amid complicating personal and political circumstances there were many questions 
Why would Khrushchev do this? What was his end game? What was the man possibly trying to accomplish? Was there a way to solve it? What did Kennedy's advisors think? What were Kennedy's advisors options? Was he up to the task? Did he have to look? Did he have what it took? The faith of millions of people depended on his answers. The advice from Kennedy's advisors was immediate and emphatic. The missile sites must be destroyed with the full might of the country's military arsenal. Every second wasted risk the safety and the reputation of the United States. After the surprise attack on the missiles, a full-scale invasion of Cuba by American troops would need to follow. This, they said, was not more was was not on, was not only more than justified by the actions of the USSR in Cuba, but it was Kennedy's only option. Their logic was both primal and satisfying. Aggression must be met with aggression. Tit replied too with that. The only problem was that if their logic turned out to be wrong, no one would be around to account for their mistake because everyone would be dead. Unlike in the early days of his presidency, when Kennedy allowed the CIA to pressure him into supporting the Bay of Pigs fiasco, this time he surprised everyone by pushing back. He had recently read Barbara Touchman's The Guns of August, a book about the beginning of World War I, which imprinted on his mind the image of overconfident world leaders rushing their way into a conflict, conflict that once started, they couldn't stop. Kennedy wanted everyone to slow down so that they could really think about the problem in front of them. This is... In fact, the first obligation of a leader and a decision maker. Our job is not to go with our gut or fixate on the first impression we form about an issue. No, we need to be strong enough to resist thinking that it's too neat, too plausible, and therefore almost always wrong. Because if the leader can't take the time to develop a clear sense of the bigger picture, who will? If the leader isn't thinking through all the way to the end, who is? We can see in Kennedy's handwriting notes taken during the crisis, a sort of meditative process by which he tried to do precisely this. On numerous pages, he writes, missile, 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 or veto, 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 or leaders, leaders, leaders. On one page, showing his desire to not act alone or selfishly, consensus, consensus. On a yellow legal pad during one meeting, Kennedy drew two sailboats, calming himself with the thoughts of the ocean he loved so much. Finally, on White House stationery, as if to clarify himself, the only thing that mattered, he wrote one short sentence. We are demanding the withdrawal of the missiles. Perhaps it was there, as Kennedy sat with his advisors and doodled, that he remembered a passage from another book he'd read by the strategist B.H. Littleheart, A Nuclear Strategy. In Kennedy's review of the Hart's book for a Saturday Review of Literature a few years before, he quoted the passage. Keep strong if possible. In any case, keep cool. Have unlimited patience. Never corner an opponent and always assist him to save face. Put yourself in his shoes so as to see things through his eyes. Avoid self-righteousness like the devil. Nothing is so self-blinding. It became Kennedy's motto during the missile crisis. I think we ought to Think of why the Russians did this, he told his advisors. What is the advantage that they are trying to get, he asked, with real interest. Must be some major reason for the Soviets to set this up. As author Schlesinger Jr., Kennedy's advi advisor and biographer, wrote, 
With his capacity to understand the problems of others, the president could see how threatening the world might have looked to Kremlin. This understanding could help him respond properly to this unexpected and dangerous provocation and give him insight into how the Soviets would react to that response. It became clear to Kennedy that Khrushchev put missiles in Cuba because he believed Kennedy was weak. But that didn't mean the Russians believed their own position was particularly strong. Only a desperate nation would take such a risk, Kennedy realized. Armed with this insight, which came through long discussions with his team, designated as ESCOM, he began to formulate an action plan. Clearly, a military strike was the most irrevocable of all the options, nor, according to his advisors, was it likely to be 100% effective. What would happen after that? The Kennedy wondered. How many soldiers would die in an invasion? How would the world respond to a larger country invading a smaller one, even if it was to deter a nuclear threat? What would the Russians do to save face or protect their soldiers on the island? Those questions pointed Kennedy toward a blockade of Cuba. Nearly half of his advisers opposed this less aggressive move, but he favored it precisely because it persevered, preserved his options. The blockade also embodied the wisdom of one of Kennedy's favorite expressions. It's u- it, it used time as a tool. It gave both sides a chance to examine the stakes of the crisis and offered Khrushchev the opportunity to re-evaluate his impression of Kennedy's supposed weakness. Some would later attack Kennedy for this, uh, this choice too. Why challenge Russia at all? Why were there missiles such a big deal? Didn't the United States have plenty of their own pointed towards the Soviets? Kennedy was not unsympathetic to this argument, but as he explained to the American public in his address on October 22nd, it wasn't possible to simply back down. The 1930s taught a clear mission. Aggressive conduct, if allowed to go unchecked and unchallenged, ultimately leads to war. This nation is opposed to war. We are also true to our word. Our unswerving objective, therefore, must be to prevent the use of these missiles against this or any other country and to secure the withdrawal or elimination from the Western Hemisphere. We will not prematurely or unnecessarily risk the cost of worldwide nuclear war in which even the fruits of victory would be ashes in our mouth. But neither will we shrink from that risk any time it must be faced. What's more remarkable about this conclusion is how calmly Kennedy came to it. Despite the enormous stress of the situation, we can hear in tapes and see it in transcripts, and photos taken at the time, just how collaborative and open everyone was. No fighting, no raised voices, no finger pointing. And when things did get tense, Kennedy laughed it off. Kennedy didn't let his own ego dominate the discussions, nor did he allow anyone else's to. When he sensed that his presence was stifling his advisor's ability to speak honestly, he left the room so they could debate and brainstorm freely. Reaching across party lines and past rivalries, he consulted openly with the three still living ex-presidents and invited the previous Secretary of State Dean Aitchison into the top secret meetings as an equal. In the tensest moments, Kennedy sought solitude in the White House, Rose Garden. Afterward, he would thank the gardener for her important contributions during the crisis. He would go for long swims, both to clear his mind and to think. He sat in his specially made rocking chair in the Oval Office bathed in the light of those enormous windows, easing the pain 
it is back so that it might not add to the fog of cold water that has descended so thickly over Washington and Moscow. There is a picture of Kennedy with his back to the room, hunched over, leaning posted. Both fists on the big desk he had been cho- chosen by millions of voters to occupy. This is a man with the fate of the world on his shoulders. He has been provoked by a nuclear superpower in a surprise act of bad faith. Critics are questioning his courage. They are political considerations, personal considerations. There are more factors than any one person should be able to weigh at one time. Yet he lets none of this rush him. None of it will cloud his judgment or deter him from doing the right thing. He is the stillest guy in the room. Kennedy would need to stay that way because simply deciding on the blockade was only the first step. Next came announcing and reinfor- and enforcing this 500-mile no-go zone around Cuba, which he brilliantly called a quarantine to underplay the more applicative implications of a blockhead. There would be more belligerent accusations from the Russians and confrontations at the UN. Congressional leaders voiced their doubts. 100,000 troops still had to be readied in Florida as a contingency. Then there would be the actual provocations. A Russian tanker ship approached the quarantine line. Russian submarines surfaced. An an American U-2 spy plane was shot down over Cuba and the pilot killed. The two biggest and most powerful countries in the world were eyeball to eyeball. It was actually scarier and more dire than anyone knew. Some of the Soviet missiles, which had been previously thought to be only partly assembled, were armed and ready. Even this, even if this was unknown, the awful danger could be felt. Would Kennedy's emotions get the best of him? Would he blink? Would he break? No, he wouldn't. It isn't the first step that he showed me, he said to his advisors, as much as to himself. But both sides escalating to the fourth and fifth step, and we don't go to the sixth, because there's no one around to do so. We must remind ourselves that we are embarking on a very hazardous course, The space Kennedy gave Khrushchev to breathe and to think paid off just in time. On October 26th, 11 days into the crisis, the Soviet premier wrote Kennedy a letter saying that he now saw that the two of them were pulling on a rope with a knot tied in the middle, a knot of war. The harder each pull, the less likely it would be that they could ever untie it. And eventually, there would be no choice but to cut the rope with the sword. And then, Khrushchev provided an even more vivid analogy, one as true in geopolitics as as it is in everyday life. If people do not display statesmanlike wisdom, he said, they will eventually reach the point where they will clash like blind walls, and then mutual annihilation will commence. Suddenly, the crisis was over as quickly as it began. The Russians, realizing that their position was untenable and that their tests of the U.S. resolve had failed, made signs that they would negotiate and they would remove the missiles. The ship stopped dead in the water. Kennedy was ready too. He pledged that the United States would not invade Cuba, giving the Russians and their allies a win. In secret, he also let the Russians know that he was willing to remove American missiles in Turkey, but would do so in several months' time, 
so as not to give the impression that he could be pressured into ab abandoning an ally. With clear thinking, wisdom, patience, and a key eye for the root of a complex, provocative conflict, Kennedy had saved the world from a nuclear holocaust. We might say that Kennedy, if only for this brief period of little less than two weeks, managed to achieve the stage of clarity spoken in the ancient Chinese text, the Tao Te Ching. As he stared down nuclear annihilation, he was careful as someone crossing an ice over the stream, alert as a warrior in enemy territory, courteous as a guest, fluid as melting ice, shapeable as a block of wood, receptive as a valley, clear as a glass of water. The Taoists would say that he had stilled the muddied water in his mind until he could see through it. I borrowed the image from the Emperor Marcus Aurelius, the Stoic philosopher who himself had stared down countless crises and challenges. Kennedy had been like the rock that waves kept crashing over. It stands unmoved, and the raging of the sea falls still around it.